Good evening to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear, dear friends and colleagues, I think we are really happy that so many people are showing up tonight for our uh, evening event on the issue of justice, accountability towards um, international crimes in Syria. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome you here in the Heinrich Böll Foundation today. The event tonight is the second one of its kind. In March, we already hosted an evening for a full, uh, uh, full of moving discussions on the war and crimes perpetrated in Syria. The Syrian lawyer, Masen Davish, who is our guest tonight as well, then said that the mere possibility of seeking justice for what is happening in his home country meant the world to him. I quote him. In order to pave the way for true reconciliation and a lasting peace, you need to ensure people's belief in nonviolence, the law, and international law norms. Justice is a key element of this process, he said. I agree with his assessment wholeheartedly. This is not only the reason why the Heinrich Böll Foundation continues to support legal efforts to seek justice for Syria. It's also why tonight, once again, we want to come together and explore what justice can mean for Syria and how we might be able to achieve peace in Syria. Since March, a lot has happened in Syria. We are what feels like further than ever from even thinking about peace. Yet, media coverage has moved on to other topics here in Germany and elsewhere. In the political arena, negotiations are focusing on local ceasefires and de-escalation zones. But atrocities continued, continue unabated. September was the deadliest month this year for civilians in Syria. Almost 1,000 civilians dead, more than 200 of them children. We hear daily reports of attacks on residential areas, schools, and hospitals. The majority of victims here again, children and women. The international co uh, coalition's victories over the so-called IS came at a heavy price for civilians in eastern Syria. The airstrikes meant to root out jihadists but caused extensive damage resulting in the deaths of hundreds of civilians. And while agreements including included routes for free movement of civilians and others for delivery of humanitarian aid, neither were provided. Convoys of hundreds of civilians were stuck in the middle of the Syrian desert by American airstrikes, preventing the people from reaching their destination. Other areas saw direct attacks on medical facilities, depriving the people in need of their right to life-saving medical care. The Syrian regime deliberately continues to block access to vulnerable people in need, using the deprivation of aid as a weapon in its war against its own people. And the notorious detention centers and prisons of Syria's complex system of competing intelligence services continue to be black holes. Those inside do not have access to a, to a lawyer. Thousands are documented to have died in custody, starved to death, or as a result of torture. We might not know all the details of the war in Syria, but we do know this. Many different actors commit atrocious crimes in this war. 
IS and other violent extremists, foreigners from Europe, the Middle East and Central Asia, commit war crimes on a daily basis. But the perpetrator of most crimes by far is the Syrian regime under Bashar, Bashar al-Assad itself. And let me be clear, not as the infamous collateral damage we keep hearing about, but as a deliberate strategy of war to eliminate, humiliate, and mute all those who are not pledging unconditional support to the regime. What, in, what happens in Syria poses a very serious question to all of us. What to do in the face of powers and actors who have no respect for human rights, international law and norms, and no, no humanity. Multilateralism definitely is failing in Syria, is failing the Syrian people. UN Security Council is not fulfilling its duty to uphold their rights and take action to end the war. The first attempt to address mass murder, mass murder in war was, were the Nuremberg trials. Its most important legacy was not the conviction of the war criminals itself. It was the man, me, message that waging aggressive wars and committing systematic mass murders of civilians is a crime that must not go unpunished, that you don't get away with it. Today, these crimes are being committed in Syria, and the perpetrators are getting away with it. We have to find answers and a response to this dreaded, dreaded ter, tragedy, sorry. Find means that don't leave us helpless victims and silent bystanders in the face of cross injustice. The documented evidence of crimes committed in Syria is overwhelming. In Stephen Rapps, one of the crime's most renowned investigators' own words, it's the biggest volume of documents since Nuremberg. We must not allow them to get buried one day in the efforts of reconstruction. For the survivors, the experiment, experience of cross injustice will not just go away. It can't be buried. Justice for Syria and the victims of its war cannot remain an abstract concept. The first step for survivors is to have access to justice. And while there is no prospect of an international court or tribunal for the war in Syria, in Germany, we have the legal principle of universal jurisdiction. The ECCHR, the Syrian Center for Legal Research and Studies, and the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Speech as well as the ECCHR and group around the Syrian defector CISA are using it to bring the evidence collected to court. I think it's an amazing effort to hold the war criminals of Syria accountable. And it gives me great pleasure to see such a coalition of people working together to seek justice. And I'm, as the president of this foundation, I'm very proud that the Heinrich Böll Foundation can support them in their efforts. We know that seeking justice and establishing the truth in a court is a tiresome process. A lot could go wrong, and we have all to be prepared that the outcome of the legal proceedings might be dissatisfying. That is bitter. And yet, it's a right step, an imperative step, with so much evidence in our hands towards justice and for Syria to build a different, a peaceful future. The people who are here as guests on our panels tonight give me the optimism that they can succeed, that there is hope that there might be justice for Syria 
one day. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and trying to get us further in this very, very important process. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Barbara Unmusik and um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, not only for hosting us tonight, but also for supporting our efforts towards accountability. And uh, a big thank also to Amnesty International, who is uh, cooperating the same way with us. Uh, Markus Beko here will later stay where I am now. Um, the question um, um, Barbara already addressed why Germany. Um, um, the, 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 the bad answer is, the dark answer is, there is no international uh, forum for justice in Syria. Um, the, let's say, optimistic answer is, um, yes, there is no justice so far, but there are at least some efforts on the national level. Um, we have been criticized for what we have been saying here on March when we presented the first uh, complaint. People were saying you're over-optimistic, you're creating expectation, especially amongst the exiled Syrian community. Um, we discussed it all over again, and we say the claim for justice is not some is not a naive claim or not a naive hope. We are working. We start to work for justice. We know that this is a very very tough effort, but we know that there is no alternative to start at some point. And we have the example. I mean, we have the Pinochet case, where Spanish lawyers filed a complaint, not knowing that Pinochet will some at some point travel to 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 London and get arrested there. And and I, I could give you a number of examples where, you know, nobody thought, um, the Guatemaltecans, nobody thought that Rios Mont would stand in trial. But some people worked on it. Some people worked on it. Some people started to collect evidence. Some people came out and gave testimonies. And that is what we're trying to do here. Why Germany? Because Germany has, and Barbara mentioned it already, but, uh, quite favorable, favorable laws for universal jurisdiction. The so-called Völkerstrafgesetzbuch is in a way, and that's, that's a pity, kind of outstanding in Europe. We hope that after the Syrian experience, other jurisdiction will probably reform their laws. Belgium, Spain, who were the first to apply universal jurisdiction now with very bad laws, but we hope that we can trigger also a discussion on the realistic and pragmatic use of universal jurisdiction as a last resort. The second good uh, prerequisite in Germany is now we have a quite open um, prosecutor's office, the Bundesanwaltschaft in Karlsruhe, who are since 2011 investigating crimes in Syria. And last but really not least, we have a very, very uh, active exile community of Syrians. We may have half a million of Syrians here, amongst them activists, amongst them lawyers, and uh, dozens and, and dozens of torture survivors. Some of them will speak here um, later tonight. And all this together is, uh, forms a critical mass. And um, so we are very happy to have in this exile community our friends from uh, Mazen Davis um, group as um, SCM and Anwar al -Buni um, Syrian, um, Syrian center. Without them, we couldn't get so far as we are right now. I leave it up to you. Um, we think we came quite, uh, quite far in this, in this, in this last eight months when we filed the first complaints. And you mentioned Nuremberg, Barbara. Nuremberg was, you know, going after the elites after the, the top of the hierarchy of the Nazi system, the Wehrmacht top, the, 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 the industry, um, and the politicians, the uh, um, bureaucracy, and it was not going after you know, some random commanders of, of some prison. While universal jurisdiction in Europe is now functioning, you know, whoever flies into our countries and uh, prosecutors are kind of waiting for them, and it's a very, it's a, no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, 
it's, it's like a, a, a result, a natural result of bad laws, but it's also a result of the attitude of prosecutors who are just waiting. If someone comes and then the, 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 the statistic is quite poor. We have some already some, uh, some, some trials ended here, but it were trials against low rank uh, people and especially terrorism suspects from the Al Nusra front and from ISIS. May they face justice. We're not against that. But uh, without directing uh, trials against Ali Mamluk and Jamil Hassan, the picture is incomplete. And this is where we stepped in, together with, um, with our Syrian friends, who will speak later on. And this is where we said, uh, we know that these suspects are not coming to Germany in the near future, but we want still to have investigations against the whole structure, because it's about a system of torture. It's about a hierarchy, which, are, which, is, which is constructed to carry out torture since decades. And we want Ali Mamluk and Jamil Hassan's name on arrest warrants, which might, might not be realized in the very near future in Germany, but they will travel, as Pinochet and others had traveled. And also, it's a very important interim result that prosecutors and judges in Germany say, this is absolutely illegal, this is unlawful. And um, so that together with the, with the UN mechanisms, the Commission of inquiry and the triple IM where we're very happy to have um, the head of triple IM to, uh, speaking today here this is a complementary picture we do the best of the situation what international politics allows um, the German prosecutors are really interested in, in investigating this phase. We saw that when we delivered the CISA files um, in September to uh, the cultural prosecutors, when we know, and you can read it in Der Spiegel, they are now um, search, given, they, have a, uh, they have ordered a forensic opinion on 25,000 CISA photos. And this is not only for the current trials in Germany, this is for all European prosecutors so they want to trigger an investigation on different uh, forum, and they explicitly say this might also serve an international tribunal in the near future or, of course, and that is all our hope, transitional justice in Syria at some day. Um, we want, I mean, it's, it's, it's an, what happened in Syria can never it, there will be never justice for what happened. That is impossible. It is impossible. It's always an approach. It's a process. And we would like to invite all of you to be part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara and Wolfgang Kalleck. I'm very grateful for this occasion, and I'm so happy to see that really the interest is so big. Apologies that we started a bit late, and that now I'm also harassing everybody who's here, but I would kindly ask the panelists who will be joining me to come now uh, to uh, join me here so everybody can see who are the people to share with us their experience. Please, Anwar, uh, take a seat. I think it is supposed to be. Well, you'll be sitting right next to me, so please. Then uh, Tariq Al-Hokan, please, uh, right to Anwar, and uh, Yazan and Ibrahim, if you want to come to my left-hand side. Uh, yes. I will. Okay. I'm Bente Scheller. I'm the director of Heinrich Böll Foundation's Middle East office in Beirut. From there, we work on Lebanon, on Syria, and Iraq. And we have been in touch with many of those who I see here in this room. Uh, many of you already know for quite a long time, but haven't been focused on justice, on human rights in Syria. And I'm very pleased that now we will have this session, but it will also be a difficult one. You are seeing we're here uh, on the one hand having input from the legal side. To my right, we have Anwar al Buni, who is a human rights lawyer from Syria. For years, if not decades, he has been working on human rights in Syria. He has been defending many people who got 
into the regime prisons and who were tried in Syria. And he himself is not only a lawyer, he's also a survivor who was arrested for his engagement and spent years in prison. Today he's living here in Berlin and he's head of the Syrian Center for Legal Research and Studies. So we will hear you later on. Uh, to my very right, we have Tarek al Hokan, who I am very pleased to introduce as a member of the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression that is led here in Berlin by Mazen Darwish. Also, Mr. Hokan is a lawyer who has spent a lot of time already long before 2011 working on human rights crimes committed in Syria, who has always been on the side to defend the rule of law in Syria, and he is now also living in Berlin. Then to my left, we have two people who have been working on these cases. Both of them are survivors of detention facilities, of prisons in Syria. And I really find it very courageous that they will share their stories here with us. We have with us Yazin Awad, who is a survivor, a survivor of the Air Force intelligence detention. Maybe it's not very clear why Air Force intelligence should be involved in the first place. Therefore, I would like to highlight in Syria we have a huge number of intelligence services, but one of the most notorious, if not the most uh, infamous, is Air Force intelligence. This derives from the fact that the former president and father of the current president, Hafez al-Assad, was member of the Air Force, and I think it came from him taking his closest, most loyal circle to be the strongest party in control and the least bound by any laws, and I think today we still have the same situation. And we have with us Chapal Ibrahim. He is a survivor of Sednaya prison. I will not say many words on Sednaya prison because after this panel, we will have a, a, a presentation. Uh, Marcus Vico from Amnesty will give us an insight in the investigations that Amnesty did into Sednaya prison, the structures. And I mean, I, one remark that I would like to do is that we always heard of the the series of arrests and how it happens in Syria, that first often people end up in detention centers and that this is really kind of a black box. They disappear, they are not entitled to have legal assistance and we thought it is already a good sign if somebody makes it uh, to be transferred into a prison after reading the chilling report about Sidnaya prison, we were aware that executions are happening there on a daily basis and it's by no means a good sign for people to make it there because many will not make it out. So I really uh, know we are constrained in terms of time, therefore also please excuse that this panel will not hold a part of uh, questions. I also think there are room, there is room in the panel um, to, to later on, I mean in the break or after the event, talk to people. You will recognize them easily and I think the courage that they muster to be here in public will really be encouraging for you also to approach them. I, however, would like to encourage all of you, please stick to the time limit. I mentioned it before, I will cut you short because we have to give space to what comes after this as well. So please, 10 minutes, not more, and I will watch about it. Uh, Yazan, I would like to start with you. Could you please um, tell us about your personal experience and also what it means for you that you can be part of this process here? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm one of the survivors from the Air Force um, intelligence. I was uh, 14th of November 2011. I was arrested, and uh, 27th of March uh, 2012, I was um, released. Uh, I was in uh, communicating uh, until we have now reached uh, that the case that we will. Uh, as previous detainees of the Air Force intelligence, we will raise our voice. Uh, I'm not talking about the detainees from other uh, branches of the intelligence. I would like to say about myself, I have many stories to tell, but at this moment, we have to put ourselves in the situation and imagine 
what could be happening right at this moment at the Air Force Intelligence. Um, the suffering is really huge. The detainees would probably now be just dreaming of being released and hoping a lot that we uh, get their voices, we transport their voices here. And I really hope that we can reach the release of all detainees. Jamil Hassan uh, is uh, the one of the biggest uh, uh, criminals. So at this, I'm trying to remember now my colleagues and what I could do uh, because every morning we would all ask each other what did you dream we would all dream that uh, a mi missile would hit the wall the wall would break open and we would all uh, run free uh, first thing I would also like to um, reach out to the mothers of martyrs who have been killed and who still don't know of the fate of their children I, I wish you all strength by God and I wish that with all the efforts of us all and with your humanitarian feeling that we would all um, at the moment 14 people have filed the complaint okay uh, we are just 14 people who have filed complaints but we hope uh, that we are talking in the name of all detainees in the prisons my experience was four and a half months in which I was subject to torture. At the beginning, uh, the first two months, and then there was no torture. And I personally uh, was tortured on the words uh, 21, 22, 23, uh, several numbers. I remember the number, uh, the name of the days uh, on which I was tortured. And to me, the day 60, 36 was the diff most difficult day in my life because I was tortured for a very long time, about between 8 and 12 hours. It's n impossible for me to remember exactly how long I was tortured. And to at the end, I confessed against my mother uh, that she is a terrorist uh, of the revolution. And I also confessed that I killed Saad al-Hariri. Uh, this is all documented. And I also confessed that Obama's daughter is my uh, girlfriend. Uh, so that really proved that the terrorist uh, thoughts uh, on this terrorist uh, terrorist um, uh, ideas are from the West. On that day, when I confessed that my mother uh, was a terrorist. Five minutes later, they brought in a female detainee uh, because it's separated uh, after uh, gender. They brought in a, mother, a, a woman and started torturing her. Of course, my eyes were blindfolded, so um, I th the torture that happened against this woman, I didn't know who she was, was maybe... It, it was psychological torture for me. It was very extreme torture because I even got the idea to confess that my mother is a terrorist. And they brought in a woman and started torturing her. This was maybe the worst psychological torture. Um, I, I don't know this woman. I hope that she forgives me, whether she's alive or dead. And after, um, w when I was done with these confessions, they uh, cut the rope down, so I fell down. And I thought that I was uh, dead. Um, uh, because another uh, a man who uh, a man who was tortured for eight hours and then who was let down from the rope uh, I, I ran because I thought that I was fleeing I without eyeglasses unfortunately I don't see anything I started running uh, to the uh, assistant who was torturing me just because I wanted to see his face just because I wanted to complain to God against him. And then five people attacked me, and everyone used whatever was in his hands, uh, uh, whatever they found in, in their way, the uh, electrocutor, the, t the taser. Uh, th there are level one and level two tasers. So when they all attacked me at once, my only concern was that I wanted to remember the name of the guy who tortured me. I was hit and attacked a lot. They kept hitting me, and it was impossible to explain or to describe. One guy was holding a Kalashnikov, and, um, and with the other hit, the Kalashnikov was inside of me. I really suffered a lot, more than two years. I was not able to eat uh, or 
to go to the toilet and then um, I lost a lot of weight. And the first question asked to me, the journalist, did you eat well? Did you sleep well? How many were you in the room? I would like to tell you that all these questions that are asked, this place is Neverland. This, it's no way to give the same an to receive the same answer from two detainees because everybody receives different um, handling and a different situation even to the hour the system in the morning is different from the system in the evening there was no system there is so uh, they would also move us from one room to the other so in the first month alone i was moved between seven rooms and from one room to the other the system of food and drinks and sleep and uh, free time and everything is different now i would only like to say that i wish from god that he would release all detainees and i wish for us um, justice because justice is our target and i believe in god and i believe in the efforts of you ladies and gentlemen and if you uh, and of, in your efforts as journalists in your humanitarian um instincts and i i'm sure that we will reach justice in the end Thank you very much, Yazan. I find it so hard already to listen to it, and I, I can't really imagine how it is to go through that. And I mean, do you, I have one question for you because uh, Wolfgang Kalik was also mentioning it in the beginning. There are those files, the so-called Caesar files, photographs, 55,000 photographs a military photographer took of people who were not survivors, who were victim of the torture system. And I mean, have you had a look at them? Uh, is it even possible for you to look at uh, things like this? Um. When I got away, when they, these pictures got out, for me it was, for all of us as Syrians, it was a real big shock, not only for those who, families who had sons and daughters detained. For a very long time I was convinced that my friends would still be alive. We were arrested, four of us together. I was only then I was convinced that they, most of, most of them died. When I saw these pictures, two of them did not survive, and two of them were tortured to death in 2012 in Sidnaya, Abdul Rauf Sidel Hadaham, and another friend of mine. I saw uh, the pictures of the Caesar files. I saw them over and over again, more than 100 times, and I still cannot believe it. And I couldn't sometimes not even still accept that my friends had died and had been died in the, in, during to torture. When this all started, I got in touch with a friend and I got the first picture and then I looked at it for about an hour. And uh, one of my friends uh, was in the pictures that got out and we were detained to get, uh, arrested together. So we were four, as I said before, and only two of us came out alive. And then once we have confessions, then building on these confessions, more people will be arrested. So seven, then after the confessions, another 36. So I think all uh, of us Syrians know what it means to come out of a prison such as the one of the uh, military intelligence. I hope that God may help all of the mothers who saw the pictures of their sons in the picture in the picture files. No, now for 60s if you've been dying as detainees they are waiting to be released six years it's been now that these crimes and against human rights are, are happening every moment and we are still not knowing all of it and we still hope that we can finally reach a good end to this thank you very much uh, coming from one tough facility to the other, uh, Shapal Ibrahim, could you tell us about your experience? Was it also the same as, uh, as Yazan described, that you have the impression everybody took their own experience from Sitnaya? Uh, how, how much would you interact with your cellmates? How much was it a group or an individual existence inside the prison? Uh, 
Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank the Heinrich Böll Foundation and all the other organizations who have organized this event and invited us. Very honestly speaking, 10 minutes is like telling me, OK, to go into the prison over again. It's like 10 minutes back in Sydney. For I think it's not even, even enough to have two months to talk about Sydney. And the other thing is that we have now have had <coughs> seven seven years that we've undergone this, and we have not been talking about this enough. It, but the international community should have had a sp specific standpoint and have, should have taken a specific stance and how we really could build a democracy in Syria, uh, and which we have here in Germany and other countries over the world. But, but now we only have only been talking for the last seven years about prisons and torture and not about how to build up a new country and a new democracy. Sednaya, of course, is, I think, one of the worst prisons the world over. The Sednaya prison is something horrific. I have been in seven other prisons before I entered Sednaya prison belonging to the military and service. And Sednaya prison, after four months only, I learned that I was actually in the Sednaya prison. After one year and six months, I came out of this prison, and I didn't know that I'd been there. I only learned that by way of the internet and by Amnesty uh, International that I'd really been in this prison. Uh, and once the military police had delivered us to Sydney prison, we tried, when we were transported in the car, I'd like to inform you that, that the transport of detainees from one facility to another is, <clears throat> is, 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 is conducted in very secure ways because they are afraid that people introduce themselves by the food trucks into the prisons. So, so we were blindfolded. We could not see very much. But we, what we could see what was that we had 200 military elements attacking us, coming up to us in full military dress. We felt like we were in, had arrived in hell. So we were held in the first detention place for one day in, in a collective prison. After six months, I didn't even know where I was in Sednaya prison, in which floor I was. So the prisons, so I was on the visitor's floor, so to speak, what, what's it called? So I, then I was told, OK, that is the first floor. So there is a, an enormous amount of secrecy around the whole organization of the prison. So there's a huge security rule for the security services. It's an enormous apparatus. And on the other hand, I, of course, forgot, of course, to express my uh, feelings for those who died and the martyrs and the mother, Umm al who has been here, and I my sincerest condolences to her. So we, we imagine now we live in, in a highly developed country, but each day and even each week, I still dream about these prisons. And, in, and even my wife knows about this, and he tries to console me once I wake up, and she sees me having nightmares when still I don't have a problem I don't have a problem to speak to all media about this prison but unfortunately still there are diplomats who don't even know what Sydney prison is so some media people even don't know what it is haven't not heard about it and I would say that there's no prison anywhere in the world that is even comes up to 10 percent of what Sydney prison is so there are demonstrations that are happening in in my region, in the Kurdish region. Uh, many Kurds were in the first place not uh, arrested. So I was first taken to a military hospital. I didn't know where it was. And the, uh, the you wouldn't know as a detainee. You would have to close your eyes, and then you would take on someone who was so... I was uh, taken to this mil military hospital. I was, I was hit with a syringe. And also the, um, the assistants of the doctor would hit me with a sponge on, on the head. And only after a month, I, uh, of course, I, and there was, n I had, did not have a name. I had a number. I had the number 1,000, 
1,325. So the name would not be known, but each and everyone within the hospital would know me under the number 1,325. When I entered the, into the first military prison in, in, in Damascus, then I learned that on that letter it was written that I was in Sydney prison. Ooh, and, then, and then I was on this paper. It was also listed that I had been transferred to another military hospital. But that I did not know at, at the time then. The other thing is that, that I got a reason after one and six, uh, year and six months, uh, Amnesty International adopted my case of one of the forcefully disappeared persons. And I had a visit after one year and six months of five minutes. Uh, it would take another day to tell you about what happened during these five minutes of the visit. So I was heavily handcuffed, and I'm, I, st I still suffer from the, the marks of these handcuffs. I would like to, tell, to show you the pictures that were taken from me upon release. This is my picture when I was released. Uh, when I entered prison, I was 95 kilos, and when I left the prison, I, my weight was 62 kilos. The second thing is I was sentenced to 15 years of forced labor, and the, the, the judge only questioned me for a single minute. So within what they call the terrorist court, so one minute after of the leaving the prison, there's, there, it was very difficult to get off. So I was taken on an airplane when I wanted to travel, so I had to use air transport, and I need some certificates showing that I that that I uh, was allowed to travel. And then I learned that there were seven people with the same name, Shapali Bain, in the same prison. And then it was also told me that I was had been sentenced to 15 years of uh, harsh labor. I, my name was also on the list of the EU and of 93 people which had been released. And the other thing is the regime uh, had prepared a very nice plan when I wanted to leave Sioux. And when the second uh, Geneva conference was up, I, they wanted to keep me inside so I could be the part of the peaceful opposition in Syria, and they could be proud of me and brag about me. And then they could be part of the uh, organization, the organizations in 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 Geneva, and that was what in the in the end let the regime release me, even though I had been sentenced to 15 years of forced labor. Uh, so not everything has been told, but Sydney prison, there's a lot of legends and myths about and uh, things. I think that this lack of time is, does not allow us to tell you everything about Sydney prison. Thank you very much, Pal Ibrahim, for sharing this. And I really know it's, it can't do justice to anybody who spent weeks and months in these horrible facilities. I know it is uh, not right to cut people down to 10 minutes. However, I think it is a subject on which I think we need to raise as much at as attention as we can. And uh, therefore, I'm grateful that even for this short period of time, you're willing to be with us here. Thank you. Um, I, I just forgot one thing, and I would like to add it if I get just one minute time. I did not uh, talk about the um, punishments in Sarnaya, but I would like to tell you one story. One time, They uh, uh, applied uh, hair removal cream uh, on us, and after they did it, the, uh, they said that tomorrow all beards would be had to be uh, uh, the hair removed. But th imagine this: the, this hair removal cream doesn't even remove 15 hairs. They said that we'd have to be completely hairless the following day. So. As the cream is completely ineffective, we would be pulling each other's hairs. So a year later, 
of course, we didn't really know the time, so we could only guess that it was about an hour. We remained uh, until the end of the night to pulling each other. It was it was really frightening because we were afraid. Of, we were even afraid of each other. Imagine. I just wish that everybody would imagine that. Come, remove uh, your colleagues' hair from uh, their face. I, I'm sorry to tell you the story, but um, it, there might still be detainees. But this is one of the punishments that were forced upon us there. I think this and other torture techniques are also, well, it's intended that uh, people afterwards will be shy to share their experience. It's uh, the intention to humiliate and to also really have things that nobody could even imagine happening in prisons. It's, uh, it's grotesque and I think that uh, it's a good moment to hear you, Anwar. I, I know that you really know the prisons from inside and from outside. And uh, please uh, tell us about how you approach the subject now from a distance where you are uh, able to work still on the files, but from a very different position. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your interest and for your presence. Uh, the torture stories and the torture testimonies that we've heard are just a small part of the um, victim stories. And I don't think that a human mind can capture and can imagine the methods of torture that are being used in Syria. I'd like to remind you, as Yazan was telling us, that now he is remembering the detainees in Al Nazla airport. And I would like to remind you all that at this moment, while we're talking, at least one detainee is dying in Syria. Every hour, a detainee dies in Syria. I'm talking in general. This is the statistics. I'd like to answer potential questions that might come to our mind now as public. First, what will these complaints add to what already has been filed before? I think the new com complaints, or the two new complaints, will uh, rather complete the picture frame of what's happening in Syria. It will prove that the commit committing of crimes is not a systematic policy of a part of the regime to um, somehow oppress a certain policy on them, but it's a structural policy of the regime with all the um, members of it. Not only does the regime follow a criminal policy, but all figures of this regime follow a criminal policy. This is a very important point. to completes the picture. Why are these crimes being committed in this atrocity in Syria? And are they on all levels? The complaints we are filing today, they prove that the perpetrators are up to the highest rank, up to the highest level, Bashar al-Assad personally. This is a personal structure of the regime. The other potential question you might be wondering about, are these complaints in order to take revenge? And I personally, I can only speak to myself, but I also believe that all victims think the same. We will forgive what happened to us personally if we guarantee for our children and for the children of the future generations to not be victims. We do not want to have our revenge against Bashar al-Assad as victims. But we want to grant our, for our children, for the coming generations, that they will not be victims. And there is a huge difference. We seek the creation of a peaceful path to reach justice, to attain justice, a peaceful peace to 
attain the future Syria, to cut the way against the dark paths that could find their way back to Syria. We want to create hope for the coming Syrian generations instead of the frustration, the desperation that could also be abused by a huge number and a huge array of terrorist organizations, terrorist thoughts, and terrorist ideologies to turn them into criminals just as they are. Justice will not be attained for us. I personally, I do not want to have any uh, justice for myself. And I think many victims are ready to go the same way if they guarantee, if they receive a guarantee that their children won't be the victims of the future. The third question, or the third potential question, why is the Assad regime targeted by your complaints? It might be a legitimate question. I think, first of all, we will seek to attain justice against all perpetrators in Syria, wherever, whatever direction, whatever religion, whatever um, responsibility they have. We started the research and searching for the crimes of the Syrian regime for two reasons. The first reason is because of the volume and the sheer extent of the crimes and the diverse methods and the diverse use of different sorts of weapons and the vast number, hundreds of thousands of victims. I think that this is a major reason why they should be our first reason and not our, not our single reason. The second reason, and I think that this is just as important, in order to protect, uh, I'm sorry, because of the protection and the impunity that this regime is enjoying now, the feeling of impunity, they can rest secure that they will remain in that impunity. And I think all other groups in Syria committing crimes do not have and do not enjoy this feeling of impunity and that they are secure and immune against being prosecuted. The Assad regime, everybody in the highest ranks, it is the only group in Syria that feels and is completely relying on this feeling and on this power that they will remain in their state of impunity. First, the first reason for that feeling because of the Russian uh, help and the Russian support and the the second reason is because uh, the whole world still deals with the Syrian regime as if it's the legitimate government, that it still represents Syria and all international um, uh, institutions with their embass embassies and their ambassadors. And because of this reason, directing our complaints against and filing the complaints against the Syrian regime will have an important impact as to send a message that the age and the era of impunity is over, and it has to be over. In addition to that, I think that, I don't think there are many, but I think there are some who still hope that this regime can be rehabilitated and those criminals can be reintegrated in the international community in some way and that they can make the world reach out their hands and shake the hands that are filled with the blood of the Syrian people under any sort of propaganda or, or, or peaceful solution, and that we want peace, forget the past, any of these slogans. There are thoughts that go in this direction, and there are attempts, even if they remain few, but there are attempts to rehabilitate and reintegrate. This policy serves the interests of heads of states and not peoples. And I mean that this policy might be serving the interests of regimes, of uh, ruling parties, of ruling groups in states, but they do not represent and they do not represent the interests of peoples. Under the um, 
slogan of the protection of economic interests. Maybe some people think uh, of reintegrating and rehabilitating them. And I don't think that someone really thinks of rehabilitating or reintegrating Daesh or al-Nusra or any of the other groups. This is the only, the sole criminal group in Syria and the most criminal group in Syria. And there are people who think that they can return to dealing with them as if they were innocent, non-criminals, normal people whose crimes can be forgotten or forgiven. And this is why we are seeking to uh, prosecute them. We want to cut to destroy this way against this policy. Because this policy is the policy that we will stand in the way of Syria to be restructured and rebuilt. And this will not make us uh, reach the social reconciliation. And we want to restructure, rebuild Syria. We want to return democracy and the civil society. We want to return them to their normal roles and their leadership in Syria. We want to build our country in, on the grounds of democracy. I hope to have been able to answer questions that might be you might be wondering about. And I think the witness stories that we heard, the testimonies have showed you the huge extent and the systematic way and method. And this deserves the attention of the world. This deserves your all attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anwar. I know that you tend to be um, carried away, and I think we could also have followed you for much longer the same as we could have with the other panelists, but I'm really grateful you kept the time. And I think that you mentioned two very important aspects just to take it back also to the responsibility a state should have. Uh, you said that the Syrian regime still is recognized as the entity that is legitimate. And also we should remember in 2006, it accessed the Convention Against Torture, which really is uh, something that nobody could believe if it was not written there. You wouldn't notice it, 2004 even. So, um, uh, please, uh, Tarek, can you, from your institution's point of view, tell us, uh, it, like, the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression was one of the first to really come under attack in Damascus as one of the very well-known, internationally renowned institutions also. Please share with us what is, what, what is uh, your perspective from today? How can you work on the issues that made your work relevant in the first place? Thank you. In fact, what is striking when listening to Yazan and Shebal, and in addition to the pain when they were remembering and reminding us what they'd undergone and suffered, is the hope, their hope that their suffering and that the crimes that were committed against them and against the human rights will not are not going to be buried, but that the moment is going to come when the perpetrators of these tragedies that were committed against them are going to be held accountable. And also, it reminds that, that through these criminal complaints, We've already achieved a half of our goal, or more than half of our goal, which is creating hope. That hope that Yazan and Shibal still have, and also that is still with hundreds of thousands of Syrians who have suffered just as Shibal and Yazan have suffered. And this hope is uh, that there is, it gives us hope that when we have frustration that people re retreat and withdraw into them and then there is going to be extremism and the and then there are going to be many ways how this extremism is going to show up one of them is terrorism and i think that is something that we have to come to and is one of my most important objectives 
when filing these criminal complaints. There is a general conviction in the region in general and in Syria in particular that the West is no longer interested in in the form of the regime in Syria or anywhere else in the region or in the world, as long as it guarantees the interests and the policies of the West in these regions. And I think this conviction has now even developed further in the sense of that it has become in the following form, that the West is preventing change in the, in the region. It doesn't want change in the region. It is ready to interact and to deal with any regime as long as it preserves and it's and it's it, the West in the instance, even if the whole country is in, is basically a big prison for its people. So this is what creates more terrorism and more extremism. So that is why the regime is our main target. I would like to tell you a story about a lady who is one of my relatives, who is my half-sister. This woman is a teacher in the resort. Her son is 16 years old. And he was one of the best of this top of his class in the 10th grade. In 2011, he was classified by the regime as being taking part in demonstrations and that he's, he has, enjoys a certain amount of support in the streets. And the people would go out in demonstrations on the street and uh, students. And during one of these demonstrations, Mohammed, uh, that's his name, he was among the demonstrators with his colleagues and other students from the street. And he during these demonstrations, he shouted out against Bashar al-Assad. He was arrested by the security forces. He was thrown to the ground. And he, they, they came down upon him, beating him. But that was not enough. One of them approached Muhammad, who was on the throne, and he shot two bullets in his hand. That was the end of his life. That was Muhammad. Now, his mother li lives with, un with an one thing of fear, that he, she wants justice to be done for her son, that she wants to be held, this perpetrator held accountable. So we have to remember her about this, the principles that is going to be, that she is going to transmit to her students when we turn our backs on her dream of justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can just underline it is amazing to have you here. It's really great because I think people like you, with all the dire stories that you have to tell, it's very encouraging to have people who are really not willing to let go of it and who really say, we want to take this really hard step and uh, make it possible to have a better future. So I'm very, very grateful to all of you. Thank you very much for joining me, uh, Tariq, Anwar. Shibbal and Yazan, thank you very much for being here with us tonight, and I hope we will accompany what you're starting here in terms of seeking justice also in the future. Thank you. Thank you. All I have to do now is to hand over to you, uh, Marco Speco from Amnesty International. Please uh, join me here, take this microphone from me, and uh, you will introduce what you're going to present. Thank you very much. Good evening. And um, sometimes we have to be flexible, and I guess now that's what I'm up to and we are all up to because I'm not here alone. 
um, in this part, but we have an important partner who helped us with this Satnaya report at Amnesty International, which I would like to introduce to you. And as he's only here with us virtually and he has to leave very soon, I'll cut the introduction very short. Um, but nevertheless, just for you to give you some background, Amnesty has been investigating and reporting systematic torture, disappearances, and grave human rights violations in Syria since decades. And when Amnesty International was founded in 61, Peter Bennetson thought, if only the world knew, it would stand up against all those things happening. Over 50 years later, it becomes very apparent that knowing is not enough. Today the world knows. We all know, but we too often fail to act. And it seems we can know without seeing, we can see without understanding, without being moved enough to get moving. That's the reason why when Amnesty International, beginning of the year, published a report on Satnaya, we teamed up with a partner. The report, titled Human Slaughterhouse, Mass Hangings, and Extermination at Satnaya Prison, tries to summarize over 40 pages those crimes which have happened and which are happening at Satnaya Military Prison. Um, working with first-hand interviews with survivors and witnesses, as well as defectors um, who had been guards and senior officials. But it also became evident that we would have to look at different ways to make the unimaginable, not perhaps imaginable, but bring it nearer. And I think we've heard that from, from those survivors who just shared with us. And that's the point where I would like to, in a way, take you to Satnaya. Luckily, only virtually and in safety and with a return ticket. And that's where I have the privilege to introduce our guide to this journey into the horrors of Satnaya, Eyal Weizmann, who's the founder of our partner forensic architecture. And Eyal Weizmann himself is an architect who explores, as he has called it, the intersection of architecture and violence. And due to the time, I'll just hand over to Eyal Weizmann. Welcome, Eyal. It's great that you are there. You actually Thank you. see him on Thank the both screens there. I, I hope... Uh I, I, I want to I, I, I want to think you can hear me now. Is that correct? Yes, can we can. Okay, this is this is fantastic. So, um, in fact, very few um, in one's life, even as a human rights investigator, there are very few investigations that that mark one in such a profound way as the Saitnaya investigation has marked. Um, myself and, and the team at Forensic Architecture uh, that worked on it. Usually what we do in Forensic Architecture is um, look at visual evidence. Uh, we look at uh, user-generated videos, uh, user-generated uh, images. Uh, we sync them up, we find, up, find out where they were taken and what they show. Uh, in the case of Saitnaya, it was the first instant that we had no visual evidence whatsoever of that place. There was a, obviously, one could see the contours of the building on a satellite image. Uh, the building is about an hour drive north of Damascus. We can see, we know where it is, but beyond the roof, it was impenetrable not only to us, uh, but to all human rights defenders and to journalists, um, could not gain access into that building. In fact, the only people that have seen Saitnaya are either the perpetrators or the victims of that prison. And it is indeed um, that the story begins 
with survivors of Saidnaya that were uh, refugees in Turkey uh, that were in a discussion with Amnesty. And uh, in fact, the project very much arrived from their own initiative. Uh, there were always sketches, hand sketches that they were doing um, to the uh, Amnesty researchers and interviewers. Um, but we understood something very fundamental about prison and about the experience of being incarcerated in prison. Architecture is not only the place where violations take place, but architecture, and I mean the building itself, is the instrument of torture. And there was a great stake in trying to reconstruct that place that is otherwise completely uh, invisible. What I would do now is share my screen with you and um, show you, uh, and I just need a, a quick confirmation from you to, to tell me that you see my screen. Yes. yes. You do see my screen. Yes. Um, to tell you um, what we produced and more importantly, how we worked. Um, we all know that, we know it from our own experiences that our memory is a very spatial thing. We remember places, and sometimes when we return to places uh, physically or by looking at photographs of those places or virtually, indeed, in a model, <laughs> those recollections, uh, the things that happen to us in these places are coming back to us as memories. And that was very much the, 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 the process of working on Saidnaya. On the one hand, we interviewed each of five survivors of that prison. And we asked them very yeah. mundane hey, questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hey, hear yeah. you. The sound is great, but we are seeing your calendar. So probably it's the wrong screen. Oh, that's, that's quite embarrassing. <laughs> no, 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 nothing embarrassing. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it now? It looks like a long working day. It, it, it's still your calendar, sorry. Is it still my calendar? Okay, I do not know how that happened, because my calendar is in fact... Um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me try it again. This is very strange. Um, I will go back. What do you see now? We, we, we still see your calendar. You still see my calendar? Yes. Okay. What now we see now? you. Now we are again seeing you, but not your screen. That is, that is so strange. My calendar should be private, in fact. So I, <laughs> uh, I would force quit that. Do you see now my calendar? No, we still see you. It, so it actually worked to share the screen, but it was the wrong window, but now we no, see no, you. No, no, because this is the screen I have on, so it's very, very strange to me that this is what you see. Um, okay, I'm trying again. So, so currently we see you. Now we see Sanaya, thank you. Oh, fantastic, okay. So sorry, sorry for this. Um, Difficulty, but uh, I'm sure we can uh, we can survive that little glitch. Uh, okay, so the, the 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 thing is that we have met five survivors from Saidnaya, and each one separately um, has delivered us an interview that started from the most mundane element within that prison, starting from what they see around themselves, the cells, in fact and then outwards towards the rest of the prison. Um, the problem in this work that we had was very um, acute one. Not only were there no images of the prison, the prisoners themselves were led into the prison blindfolded. Or when they were taken outside of the cell, they had to press their hands against their eyes. The memory of that place was mainly acoustic. It was about, uh, they can estimate 
length by counting steps. They could estimate the size of rooms by the echo, the amount of echo they were hearing. And they can invest, they, they can estimate also the number of people by um, how, how your body kind of perceives proximity to other bodies. So that became a very, very complicated uh, investigation. Uh, at the end of which, we understood something uh, very important that by building a model of that prison, we also helped those survivors uh, obtain back the memory uh, of their uh, incarceration. Sometimes the hardest memories that we have, uh, the most traumatic memories, are the, those that are the most important, perhaps, to record. But the, when we try to tell those memories of pain and torture, of humiliation, memory plays trick on us. Memory does not really allow us to, to access it in a very easy way. And sometimes architecture can help us with that by, by modeling uh, slowly the very mundane thing, the very easy things, the sizes of the floor tiles, the doors, etc. we could actually um, allow repressed memory to spring out. And this is also a very dangerous process because uh, the memory of witnesses uh, is, is obviously a kind of a psychologically arduous and, and, and difficult process to undertake. And um, it was important to, to undertake it with the supervision uh, of uh, forensic uh, psychologists and, um, and, and different techniques that we were using to protect our witnesses. What I show you now is the result. Here is how we slowly strip out the outside of the, um, uh, of the prison, and we can, we can look inside. Uh, you can rotate the prison, and now the architecture of the prison become something like an interactive documentary, an interactive model, uh, by which I could go here to the center space, and um, we could find ourselves within that space. And now with the navigator, with a mouse on my screen, I can move around within that space. And then I could see um, different testimonies on which I could, I could press. And we could, for example, understand something about the sound, the, the experience, the audio experience of detainees in Saidnaya. I press into that space, and we could, we could briefly uh, hear يعني الهدوء هو السياد الموقف في كثير هدوء ما فيك تعلي صوتك ما فيك تحكي بصوت عالي دائما لازم تكون نبرة صوتك واطية فهذا الشيء بخليك تسمع كل شيء يبني تصور للأشكال والأشخاص معتمد على إيش على الأصوات اللي ممكن تصدر أثناء وجود هاي الأجسام اللي الخارجية اللي موجودة معه here you see, um, so they describe the fact that the experience of being in this prison is mainly captured by sound, not by vision. And therefore, what we had to do is a rather sophisticated process of sound modeling, modeling space by sound. Uh, what you see here is the screen, and here is the, um, the person being interviewed. Uh, together with our acoustic uh, expert, and they're trying to sample now the kind of sound that they hear and try to recreate the space from it. درجة السمع هنا بتصير أقوى ليش؟ لأن يعتمد على هاي ال 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 على هاي الحاسة أكثر من غيرها. مو تباقي الحواس مقابل هاي الحاسة. فيك تقلي بس ال عن الصدى بالزنزان. الصدى؟ إنه تحط هون في كليك بس. تقلي إذا هاي الصدى ولا أكبر ولا أصغر. 
Here, uh, we, you know, I urge you all to uh, to go to the website, and, and it's online and available, and to to experience that. But that was uh, a small methodological clip of how, uh, in fact, we, we we arrived at the architecture of the prison by uh, by modeling uh, the sound. I would like to take you now through uh, another uh, solitary cell. Again, we, uh, you navigate to it by pressing on, um, on the room, and now you can navigate, you can move within it. Um, you can find yourself more or less experiencing the dimension of that space. Of course, the cold, the hunger, the humiliation is something that you cannot model. And, um, and again, call out another testimony. In this testimony, what I want to show you is how the modeling of a very mundane element, the, uh, the architect is asking one of the detainees to help her model the window, the size of the hatch in the door, and how a memory of a torture spring out of that. Let's, let's go into this testimony. اوكي وهذا ايش ايش في تحت على هذا الارتفاع؟ نفس هي الشراقه اللي سم... نفس الشيء اللي سميناه طارقه، شيء تحت بسموه شراقه. قد ايه عرضه؟ So you see the, 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 the investigation, the conversation between them begin on something very, very mundane, the size of the hatch. And you would see how out of the, that description comes a much more horrific description. I will skip forward a little bit. Um, effectively, what happens is that he remembered the size of the hatch because he was asked to push his head through this hatch at the request of one of the guards. And this is what happens next. So this is this is a rather horrific description of being um, beaten uh, unconscious by uh, a victim whose head was pushed through the hatch. But again, a, a bit of memory that perhaps was not otherwise available, uh, not perhaps even to the survivor himself, that kind of springs out when you um, architecturally model the, the, uh, the environment uh, around. So the, in here you have uh, a number of testimonies. All of them are based on, on, the, on the following principle. To build an architecture of a place is also to build a memory of that place. Um, the, we build the model from the memory of survivors, and the memory of survivors got reconstructed because the model helped them recall various things. And I think this is a, a, an important point to make, that it is not only about providing measurable evidence, that the, that, that the practice of that work together with Amnesty International was really helping uh, those survivors to deal with the uh, trauma that they've experienced. Uh, to think 
and to believe, as, as it rightly was, that uh, they have been able to create that. And the model was a, a common process, was a process that was done together with the detainees. You see them sitting and modeling. And in fact, um, at its best is when they felt that that is their project, that they have um, produced that model, uh, of which they were very proud and, in fact, go on uh, advocating uh, for, that, um, for that case uh, based on it. Um, we have had uh, a huge response to this investigation, including a direct uh, rebuttal by Assad himself, uh, who uh, felt the heat, of course, that there was a lot of uh, uh, international attention on this, uh, directed at this investigation. Um, and also, during that investigation, and Amnesty and our researchers heard first testimonies of uh, the mass executions that were taking place in a building um, near uh, the prison. I'll show it to you. Um, the White House, the white building that is over here. Uh, and in fact, uh, Amnesty was able to follow that uh, investigation with another report uh, about that building, about the white building and the executions that were going on uh, in it. Um, you know, I think one of the most powerful uh, reports, uh, the Amnesty follow-up report uh, on, on the execution uh, that happened there. So, um, you know, this is just a, a quick, that was a very quick walk through the project, and I'll be happy to, um, uh, I'll be happy if, if, if you would have the time to, to explore it by yourself, or indeed to approach forensic architecture with any questions or uh, any requests uh, related to it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Eyal, for making it possible to be with us despite the time. Yeah, I was very happy. I was very happy to have this opportunity, and thank you. We heard at the beginning of the evening from some of the survivors and the unimaginable as part of all the human suffering and tragedy, we've now heard from Eyal what might seem rather a technical approach, but one which I believe can help not only to make visual human rights violations, which are so unimaginable, in order to provoke public debate and increase attention. But it's also actually, and when we're looking at the struggle against impunity, it presents concrete evidence, be it to political or legal forums, in enabling survivors to actually explore some of the experience in a way <laughs> which also very much demonstrate the horrendous systematic approach that these perpetrators take in, in, in these human rights violations. And um, forensic architecture also, research, some of you might know here in Germany, researched on um, the, the I mean, German NSU killings, uh, challenging that German Secret Service officer who had been at one of the murder scenes and had claimed that um, it all had happened unnoticed by him. So I guess it's all about gathering what we can gather from as many sources and in as many ways which it is um, accessible to us. And whatever approach we take, it's always only going to be parts to, to try to make visual the scope of 
crimes against humanity and really grave human rights violations. But it would be not only absurd, but also perverts to, to realize that it seems that we find it much, much easier to talk about all those minor criminal offenses and things which happen across the globe. And we are so bad at looking at the really, really terrible things which are going on. So thank you for your attention at this point, and I believe we have a break.